Okay, um, and I will pull up the slide deck. And then um, Emily Oliver, once I start sharing my screen, um, if you could begin letting people in from the waiting room. And then Monica, I would just let them know we're waiting. We're um, letting people in and we'll begin shortly and then feel free to start kind of whenever people are filtering in. Great, usually give like two minutes or? Yeah, or so. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're going to be, give just one more minute to allow other people to join. Thank you for being here. Well, I think that we're good to get this started, right? All right, well, hello and welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, and good night. I know we have people joining from different time zones and we appreciate you being here with us today to celebrate the World Oral Health Day 2023. Some housekeeping, we have translation into Spanish, French, and Portuguese for this session. So you just need to go to the bottom uh, where the controls of the session are and click on the one that has the icon of the globe. Um, you just need to select your, your language and you'll be good to go. We'll have a Q&A session led by Dr. Peter Massey at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat as the presentations are given, or you can just wait uh, at the end for um, when the presentations are done, so you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. My name is Monica Dominguez, and I am Mexican craniofacial orthodontist. I first joined Small Train in 2012 as country manager for Mexico, and in 2016 got the opportunity to oversee the programs in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. And since October of 2021, I just started this new role as director of Global Oral Health Programs 
and I am extremely happy to be with you today to share some time and we all together can learn about the importance of oral health in the comprehensive cleft care. And we will do that with our dream team speakers for today. I'll start with brief introductions of our speakers. We have Dr. Muthu Murugan, who is a pediatric dentist from India. Dr. Bernard Tansipek, plastic and reconstructive surgeon from Philippines. Mrs. Eunice Omoruji, who is a parent, a CEO, an entrepreneur from Nigeria. Ms. Grace Peters, our manager of comprehensive cleft care at Small Train from the US, and Dr. Peter Mosse, craniofacial orthodontist from Scotland, UK. And before they begin their presentations, I just want to share a bit more around why we are here today, which is the World Oral Health Day. This year, Small Train is a proud partner of the annual World Oral Health Day campaign with the World Dental Federation or FDI. The World Oral Health Day was first declared in 2007 and was originally celebrated on September 12th because it was the birth of the date of Dr. Charles Godon, who was the founder of FDI. And when FDI began their full World Oral Health Day campaign in 2013, the date was changed to March 20th, just to avoid conflict with the FDI World Dental Congress that usually takes place in September. So March 20th was selected as the official date for a few reasons related to oral health. And I want to start this morning with a quiz for the audience. And let's see who knows these oral health facts behind the date of World Oral Health Day. So I'm going to put them on the slides. And please put your answers in the chat. This might be easier for our audience from members from FDI. So please feel free to participate on this. First question here. How many teeth must senior have to be considered healthy? Okay. All right. Rachel, good to have you here. <laughs> we have some answers here. And yes, the answer is 20. We've got some good answers here. All right, let's go to the next one. How many baby teeth should children possess? Okay, Gabby and Jilly. Good shots, great. And the answer is 20. <laughs> okay, good guesses there. How Let's go to the next one. How many natural teeth must an adult have to be considered healthy? Okay, 32, there you go. Evelyn, Angelique. Uni is loving it. <laughs> Great. Good answers, Ankita. All right. A healthy adult must have 32 teeth and zero cavities. Expressed on a numerical basis, this can be translated as 320, hence March 20. So now that we have learned about World Oral Hill Day, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Muthu Murugan. Who is here already. Dr. Muthumurugan is a pediatric dentist. He's an adjunct research associate at the Center of Medical and Bioallied Health Science Research at Jam University. He's chair of the Center of Early Childhood Care Research, Department of Pediatric and Preventive Dentistry, Faculty of Dental Science of Reed Taramandra Institute of Higher Education and Research in Chennai, India. He has more than 150 publications in peer review journals. Dr. Mutu, primary area of interest is early childhood caries. Thank you, Dr. Mutu, all yours. You can unmute yourself, Dr. Mutu. Yeah, I can. Thank you, Dr. Monica, uh, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, 
I'm glad to be part of this uh, global oral health movement. And uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be here and uh, share a few uh, points uh, pertaining to uh, good oral health. And uh, the topic for today's uh, session is on uh, oral health in cleft lip and palate, uh, perspective from a, an, an oral health pro professional. Uh, just a moment, I will uh, minimize this so that I, it's not obstructing my vision, okay? So uh, mouth is said to be the mirror of the body, and uh, that's a, a great phenomenal saying. And dentistry per se uh, can be broadly categorized it, uh, into revolves around three major uh, diseases. One is tooth decay, that is dental caries. The other one is malocclusion, malalignment of teeth, and gum disease, also called as periodontal disease. So largely dentistry revolves around these three uh, disease entities and how uh, we handle these things. So in nutshell, oral health uh, is having a mouth without cavities, mouth without gum disease, teeth without gum disease, and a well-aligned teeth can largely contribute to a good oral health. The tooth decay or dental caries and periodontal disease are largely preventable and primarily in individuals with cleft lip and palate, if they can take charge of few things. Having said that, uh, if you look at the incidence of uh, two, uh, dental caries in children or adults with uh, cleft lip and palate, it is reported to be high in comparison with individuals without cleft lip and palate. And even if you look at childhood tooth decay, that is, a type of cavities which occurs in children less than six years of age. We call this as early childhood caries or early childhood tooth decay. It is also the occurrence of this disease also is very, very high in children with cleft lip and palate comparing to individuals without cleft lip and palate. But the good thing about this is, is largely preventable if oral hygiene measures are thought and addressed early in other words, if we can handle this as soon as the tooth emerges into the mouth, these diseases are largely preventable. So this is a set of pictures of children who have untreated cavities in the mouth. And if you closely look at, it's not a very uncommon thing. It's very, very common uh, uh, for the oral health professional who are working with uh, children. We see this on a regular basis. And the occurrence of cleft lip and palate uh, also makes them a little more vulnerable for this uh, process. The whole intent is to understand how to prevent this disease. If you look at the uh, impact of untreated dental caries, it can lead to a lot of physical, social, and mental effects. Largely, the untreated dental caries lead to pain, distress, loss of school days, difficulty to brush, sensitivity to thermal and physical stimulus, overall leading to a poor quality of life. In, in growing years, the psychological impact or the social impact with untreated early childhood caries or untreated tooth decay adds to the burden of cleft lip and palate. And it goes as a cycle because the moment the disease sets in, the other factors like difficulty to brush and difficulty to eat, and it, which will further aggravate the situation and it will increase plaque accumulation and increase occurrence of more disease. So it goes as a vicious cycle. And also it's said that a child who is of three years of age can understand the difference between uh, them and the ones who have these disease in the teeth. So they have a perception of self at the age of three years itself. They can differentiate between attractive and unattractive peers at the age of three years. So it's very important that it has a large uh, scale psychological impact as well. If you look at access to oral care services, high quality dental care services are very sparsely available. And generally dentistry is very technique sensitive and Provision of comprehensive cleft care services 
are limited across the globe and lack of pediatric dentist and specialist orthodontist and other specialists who are providing services to children and adults with cleft lip palate are also limited. It's essential to work on a preventive mode. It's recently written, um, uh, very well uh, written in the paper in Lancet in 2019, a paper titled Ending the Neglect of Global Oral Health, Time for Radical Action. It's a fantastic paper and clearly describes the um, failure of the West method, which is increasingly high technology centered and it's more treatment oriented or interventionist and specialist approach, but it does not tackle the causes of the disease and inequalities in oral health. It's largely treatment dominated. So in lower middle income countries, this dentistry is often unavailable, unaffordable and inappropriate for the majority of the population. So they've suggested that there is a need for a fundamentally different approach. And in, in our center for early childhood caries research, we've developed a protocol called sustained anticipatory guidance. And this is primarily aiming at preventing caries from infancy to childhood. And later on, it can be carried on to adulthood and adolescence. And generally, these principles are initiated before the tooth erupts into the oral cavity. And basically, it gives a specific guidance at appropriate time intervals. And these guidance is provided via online and offline services using WhatsApp, Gmail, and messaging services and telephone calls. And it also has an in-person consultation visits and the education and reinforcement of very important infant oral care measures and sustaining this knowledge through other modes is what we call a sustained anticipatory guidance. Uh, anticipatory guidance is a very well established philosophy in pediatric dentistry. You anticipate what's going to happen and you guide the parents. So it's a very simple approach. And how do we sustain this guidance? over the initial two to three crucial years where the disease spreads rapidly to multiple teeth. So it's important uh, to diagnose early. And one of the biggest things which has changed uh, our approach and given tremendous success in preventing disease in children with cleft lip and palate in our uh, center is for use of MAC charts. We call this as a MAC chart. So I'll show you the picture. This is all of the chart. Uh, the top two rows of the uh, teeth pictures, which you see on the screen, which is written as mild early childhood caries. Those are the earliest signs of tooth decay, and it's visible as soon as the tooth comes into the mouth. And if we do this uh, for the, we educate the parents um, with these chart in the presentation, and we tell them these are the earliest changes. This is the various patterns on by which it can appear but it will, it's visible as soon as the tooth comes into the mouth. They are called enamel defects or enamel hyperplasia. And the moment you see this, it's important that you address this at the earliest. If we don't, it goes to the moderate stage of the disease. Then if you still leave it untreated, it goes to the severe form of the disease. So it's emphasized to the parents, even before the tooth comes into the mouth during their initial early surgical visits. And this has given fantastic results for us uh, because many of the parents, we can say more than half of the parents who have seen this chart. And we also send these charts in the WhatsApp and other modes. And they have uh, brought the children back for an initial oral examination soon after the tooth comes into the mouth. It's been a big game changer for us. And we could prevent the disease close to 95 to 98 percentage uh, effortlessly using a uh, a education based approach. Uh, 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 Professor Peter Moss, you always used to say this as health coaching. And at the end of the day, it's the knowledge uh, passed on to the parents. And, and it's not as a one time passing on information, but you pass on the information, you sustain them, sustain this information uh, with periodic contact to various modes. Now, technology allows us to do that in a cost effective way. So, we have, a, uh, we could do this as a, uh, a great uh, method, a great approach to prevent early childhood caries. And if you can prevent early childhood caries in the first three to six years of life, 
you can kind of reduce around 80 to 90 percentage of decay beyond six years of life. There are a lot of signs, a lot of literature available that if you prevent early childhood caries, the chances for caries in permanent teeth is going to be significantly less. And none of these children uh, in, in, in the, over the last four or five years, uh, none of these children have to undergo uh, full mouth rehabilitation under general anesthesia for dental treatment. So this has been a big game changer for us. And uh, that's what I would like to say today. And I'm glad to be a part of this major oral health global movement. And I thank Train for believing the concept and supporting the project for us so far. And thank you very much for the entire team to give me an opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Muthu. So important and life-changing, focusing our efforts in, in prevention. Your work has been such a great inspiration for, for many. So thank you. Thank next you. Um, next speaker, we'll have Dr. Bernard Tansitek. He's a fellow of the Philippine Association of Plastic Reconstructive Anesthetic Surgeons, and he has been the founding member of the North African Official Foundation in the Philippines since 2014 which, by the way, is a small train cleft leadership center. Dr. Tansi Peck is a consultant for the Division of Plastic Surgery at multiple hospitals in the Philippines, and he has authored and co-authored several publications, including Maternal Risk Factor for Cleft Lip with or Without Cleft Palate in the Philippines. Thank you. We need to activate the, the audio. Okay, Dr. Bernard Tensipek, Impact of Poor Oral Health in Cleft Care Lecture, beginning in five. Good day. My name is Dr. Bernard Tensipek from the Nordoff Craniofacial Foundation in the Philippines. I'll be discussing impact of poor oral health in cleft care. Our situation in the Philippines is a sad one because we have one of the highest dental caries rate in Southeast Asia. Um, in a recent study, 87% of Filipinos suffer, suffer from some form of dental caries, tooth decay, or infection. 77% have never been to a dentist. We have non-fluorinated water. Our government dental health insurance is not yet established. And most oral health care professionals are located within the major cities. Because of this lack of dental health insurance, um, the cost of dental care is not within the reach of many indigent and or poor patients. Uh, we also have a lack of edu education in the field of dentistry with relation to cleft care. So there's a fear among our dental health professionals in providing treatments for cleft patients. So what is the impact of poor oral health in cleft care? Um, the major impacts are as follows. Uh, problems in growth and developmental uh, develop issues, speech and language and communication issues, uh, with delay or modification in the treatment of our patients, such that we have to use camouflage or prosthodontic treatment to replace loss or missing teeth at an early age. So here's an example of one of our cases. She had poor dental care, poor dental hygiene, so eventually losing a lot of her maxillary teeth. So we did not do any alveolar bone graft, She's partially edentulous and has severe maxillary hypoplasia, uh, creating a relative mandibular prognathism. For speech and language issues, um, our patients develop compensatory speech and use the alveolar ridge instead of their teeth to produce the needed sounds. Um, this difficulty in articulation may also be due to the maxillary hypoplasia. In some severe cases where, is, where there is a deficient alveolar structure, um, the patient can no longer adjust or be able to produce compensatory speech. So they will be in a, in, unable to produce sounds that use the front teeth, for example, the T, D, 
th the sounds z s f v and s h sounds sometimes um, the patients will also develop cognitive developmental delays from poor nutrition as a consequence or sequelae of poor dental health. So because of the need for dental rehabilitation, um, surgery is often delayed. Um, I will fo we focus on alveolar bone graft because the surgery of uh, alveolar bone graft requires very uh, good timing. Um, and the patients with mixed dentition who come to us with really bad dental caries will have their ABGs delayed because of the need for dental rehab. And subsequently, because your ABG is delayed, your orthodontic treatment will be delayed as well. So here is an example of one of the delays. Uh, after early loss of his premaxillary teeth and we had to do dental rehab, the patient's this patient came in for alveolar bone graft and as we develop the flaps here we see the premaxilla in this uh, on the circle area that has uh, severe hypoplasia but we still had to uh, place uh, our bone grafts because there's still other viable teeth in the area that can be uh, moved orthodontically um, expanded with a quad helix arch and maybe in the future he will be able to use a prostodontic or even implants to create a good uh, occlusion. We also have a lot of adult unrepaired cleft patients with poor dental hygiene so they have to go undergo dental rehab prior to any, any surgery and these patients will have their surgeries delayed a bit while they undergo the dental rehab. For our other patients, um, sometimes we have to use camouflage or prosthodontic treatment. Like this patient, he had abiflap orthodontics and prosthodontics. As we see on the picture on the left, there is early loss of his premaxillary teeth and a collapse of his dental arch that, so that we had to use a quad helix to expand. And on the right side, as you, you can see, the expanded arch and the um, prosthodontics that was used to uh, camouflage his uh, lack of dentition. So the impact of poor oral health in cleft care uh, creates a lot of issues in the long run. Patients with poor oral health, poor speech and language capabilities will have difficulty in looking for a job, difficulty in uh, creating social relationships. They will have uh, lack of acceptance among their peers and in the end have difficulty in integrating into society. This will create a lot of psychological and or social issues. So how does the NCFP try to solve these problems? We advocate for early dental assessment and treatment. We try as much as possible to educate our patients. Here is a mother's class uh, for dental health education. So we teach both parents, especially the mothers, how to care for the children, how to care for their teeth, and um, even make it a bit more fun for the children. We have dental hygiene and tooth brushing workshops. So they will be encouraged to take care of their uh, dental health. For, uh, on the foundation side, we try to recruit as many volunteer dentists as possible to, so that we can cater to the uh, indigent or poor patients. In our foundation, we also have multidisciplinary management. So we, have, we focus on dental health. And then we cooperate and do research work with the students of the University of the Philippines College of Dentistry as you reach out to the next generation of dentists so that they, they will be able to understand the situation uh, that is happening among our cleft patients in our country. So this is an example of our catch-up treatment for our patient. So this is one of the things we do. We try to compress as much of the treatments as much as to as short as time as possible so that they will be able to be integrated into society 
and get back to work and get on with their lives. So as a final message, oral health impacts all areas of cleft care. A multidisciplinary team needs to focus on oral health as it impacts their roles. And each member of the team must be involved in an oral health advocacy for their patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernie, as, as known. Um, next, we're going to have Eunice Omoruji. She is the CEO of Unixapt Consulting. She's the proud mother of three children, two of whom were born with a cleft. She's an active member of the Small Train Sing and Smile Club in Nigeria, which is a psychosocial support program aimed at helping children through speech therapy. So if we are ready, we can share about Eunice. My name is Eunice Omori. I'm based in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm an essay survivor by profession, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a mother of three children, Two were born with clefts. My two children born with clefts are a boy and a girl. The boy is the eldest, is about 11 years old, while the girl is five years old. They have both undergone surgeries and repair for the lip. The boy has undergone surgeries and repair for the pilots currently on treatment on the available grounds while the girl is awaiting her pilot repair. I apparently knew nothing about clefts, its management or any related thing concerning it until the birth of my first child. Well the I was informed that he had clefts Leap and pilot. They were missed reaction concerning the condition, the health condition, missed feelings from being happy that I, I had a successful and safe delivery, and at the same time, I was a bit sad concerning his health condition. Well, as to the information I was I was I was meant to I was meant to have was from the midwife at my son's uh, birth who explained a little about cleft and its treatment and management. And apart from that, I don't, there was no oral health care formation at that point until we were referred to the specialist for further treatment and management. Then I was told on how to feed the baby, how to care for the, the pilot, the, 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 the gun, cleaning the gun and all of that, prior to the surgery repair. This was when we were preparing for the alveolar bone graft surgery. Initially, the attention I didn't pay good attention to the oral health care because I was conscious about the surgery, the repair of the pilot, the repair of the lip, and its management. But during the investigation prior to the Avola program, it was observed that there were some mind cavities and mis position seats and I was referred to the orthodontist for further care and management. Currently, I ensure that they brush their teeth morning and evening as advised by the specialist and also once in a while, gargle their mouth with warm water and salt to reduce the influence of bacteria and further oral health complications. I was more and better informed during the uh, treatments of the of my younger child as compared to what I knew during the treatments of my first child. 
it, it was a better experience because I was more prepared physically, mentally, and uh, otherwise to take care of the, the child more than what I did during the first care treatment for the first one. Well, I think the doctors or medical personnel should be aware that most parents oftentimes pay less attention to the oral health care of their children with effects and probably concentrating more, paying more importance to the cleft treatment and management. And as a result of this, I will recommend that they should there should be a form of orientation, like I've said earlier, by the medical personnel to orientate the parents on the importance of oral health care vis-a-vis -vis the treatment and management of cleft by same seminars, workshops, and probably introducing, if available, special kind of toothbrush and mouthwash that could help the children reduce their pain and also help the parents, you know, from the trauma or fear of causing more harm to the palate while brushing with the regular toothbrush at the earlier stage of the medical treatment of clay. Parents and other families supporting cleft care need to know that having such children is not the end of the road for them. They need to be courageous. And at the same time, they need to search for appropriate medical intervention and they possibly get connected with spine train organization because through their series of awareness program and seminars has actually brought smile in Nigeria has really come to put a smile on the faces of children with death, their family, their parents, and the world at large. I want to commend their efforts and I want to say a big thank you for all that I in particular have received from them so far. I want to encourage them to keep on with their good work. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Anis. This is so important to hear from you and your perspective. I think that um, there's a lot of awareness we still need to do. And this is this webinar is one of those efforts that we will start doing because that needs to be heard. And also it's important for our clinicians to hear your perspective and knowing the whole context to understand how we can better support to make the treatment successful. So now I'm going to present our next speaker. I'm very honored to present Grace who is a beloved member of the Small Train family. She joined Small Train in 2019 to support the expansion of the Small Train comprehensive cleft care programs. Today, she oversees the Small Train global efforts to provide comprehensive cleft care to Small Train patients, including nutrition, speech, psychosocial, ENT, and oral health programs. As a person born with a cleft and member of the U.S. cleft community, Grace is a committed advocate for equity, inclusion, and increasing access to comprehensive care for people with clefts. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Monica. Um, so our oral health programs here at Smile Train are very near and dear to my heart because this is the area within comprehensive cleft care that has been crucial to my growth, development, and confidence since I was born. Um, and to this day at, at age 26. Um, so I first heard about Smile Train 
when I was in elementary school and my parents would donate and I would lead school fundraisers. And after donating, we would always receive before and after pictures in the mail of patients that we supported. And there weren't any other kids in my elementary school that had cleft. So getting these pamphlets of kids that looked like me was really special for me and made me feel less alone. When I, was for, when I first started working at Smile Train and learned about our Smile Train programs and that we supported more than just the surgery, that was really important for me. Um, and I got really excited because the speech therapy and the orthodontia and the good oral health habits that were so important for me to maintain were the areas of care that really were the most powerful for my journey and still are to this day. And I say powerful because good oral health care from day one and all of the treatment I had with braces and palate expanders, tooth extractions, implants, and so on, that not only contributed to a healthy smile, but it also contributed to my self-confidence, self-esteem, um, and self-love. And Dr. Muthu earlier touched on the psychosocial impacts of um, oral health care, and I can't reiterate that enough. Um, so one of the questions I was asked to answer um, was about my treatment journey and experiences with oral health challenges. Um, and I think if uh, I, I need more than just seven minutes to, uh, that I was given today to speak about my treatment journey, I don't think that's enough time. <laughs> um, but I will highlight a few things. Um, something that I think is really unique for the average person is that I had the same pediatric dentist from day five to day 18. And I was really, really upset when I couldn't see him after I turned 18. Um, I can't speak to others uh, with cleft, but for me having the same dentist from day one um, through the majority of my treatment timeline was an incredible privilege. Um, and the challenges that I experienced with oral health that stand out were somewhat clinical, such as having more cavities, missing bones, missing teeth, misshapen teeth that grew in, things like that, um, that my siblings and peers without cleft didn't experience. Um, but as a patient and young person growing up in the United, United States, um, these clinical challenges were important, but they were, but also the psychological challenges were also important. Uh, for example, as I got older, going back and forth to dental appointments and having more cavities than my siblings, even though I brushed my teeth just as much as they did, if not more, um, was very, very discouraging for me. Um, and also having braces for 11 years, um, just the going back to treatment and feeling upset and anger towards my treatment timelines that were constantly pushed back, um, that was definitely disheartening and made me feel upset. So my self-awareness as a young person was very strong because of this. However, uh, these challenges were definitely mitigated because I had such a strong CLEP team that worked together and gave my parents the reassurance, who gave me the reassurance that even though I was feeling this way, I would be okay. Um, and so my family was set up for success in taking care of me since day one. Um, because they knew they were going to have a baby with cleft. And this is and was a privilege to have this type of information. Because at day five, when I was having trouble swallowing uh, milk and trouble eating, they didn't panic and knew exactly where to take me to get fitted for an obturator, uh, which is uh, it's similar to a retainer, um, that helped me feed and helped me grow. I also just wanted to point out that I did have to call my dad yesterday for this information because I don't remember day five of my life. Um, but the obturator did help me uh, feed, which helped me grow. And my, my parents had to have good oral health habits because they needed to clean this obturator and these devices every day and sterilize it as best as they could. On top of that, my parents um, had to go back and forth to the hospital every two weeks to get me fitted for a new obturator. Um, so this was definitely a challenge, but something that they knew that they had to prioritize. As far as my family and cleft team, uh, their approach to oral health uh, through the different stages of care, um, my pediatric dentist always pulled my mom and dad aside and prepared my parents for the next steps 
and they were very reassuring to them of the process so that my family could then reassure me as the person going through all this treatment and help me understand what was going on. Um, and something that I just wanna continue to say is that my family and me as a patient, we were part of the team and the pediatric dentist um, and my club team made sure of that. Um, and as I mentioned, my pediatric dentist who he was an incredible person, um, but also a key person in my treatment timeline. He was in constant communication with my oral surgeon, my orthodontist, which was super important for me and my family so that everybody was on the same page. Um, and uh, according to the American Cleft Palate and Craniofacial Association, um, they say and recommend that all individuals um, with craniofacial anomalies, including cleft, should be managed by an interdisciplinary team of specialists. Um, these mis mis multidisciplinary follow-ups of patients um, that I experienced, my family experienced, um, they might look different in different cleft centers around the world, but if the cleft team has good communication and respect for one another um, to ensure that the patient is receiving optimal care, uh, I think that that is super important and is definitely something that I had. And I know that's uh, definitely a privilege. Um, and I know we're running out of time here, um, but I guess I just wanted to end with uh, something that I would share with patients, families, clinicians, or anybody on this call, um, is that it is a process. The oral health uh, timeline of a patient with cleft is starts from day one and continues until 26 and beyond. And so um, having the right resources and that Smile Train has and um, others have, uh, I think is super important. And um, it's a process and it's not easy, but uh, it's you'll get through it. And like Eunice said, having courage is um, something that you just need to, to continue to have. And I will pass it over back over to you, Monica. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It's very inspiring and it is very important for us to keep all of this in mind as we build different you know, resources, as we build a strategy for how to implement or, um, oral health in comprehensive cleft care. And again, you give us more tools to keep knowing that comprehensive approach is the right approach. Thank you so much, Grace. And now I would like to go with our final speaker, Dr. Peter Mossi, who is the Associate Dean for Internationalization at the University of Dundee Dental School and Director of the WHO Collaborating Center of Craniofacial Anomalies. He is the leader of the Craniofacial Anomalies team of the WHO Global Burden of Disease birth defects initiative. He was appointed honorary secretary of the Craniofacial Anomalies Group of the, at the AAPR, Global Oral Health Inequalities Research Network, initiated in August to the, 2012. And he's a member of Small Train Research and Innovation Advisory Council. Dr. Peter Mossi, thank you so much for being here with us today. I think we're going to be sharing, you're going to be sharing your presentation, correct? Okay, can I? I seem to have lost the link, Monica. Oh, if um, we can we can share the presentation on our site if you feel that's. Um, you can just go down and click on, on share screen and then choose your window. I'm not even seeing the screen now for some reason. Uh, oh, 
Well, while we take care of um, of that technical issue, I just want to reassure everything that we have just been hearing from Grace again and from Eunice. I think it, it is very important that we learn about all the you know, clinical topics and academical topics, but also knowing that we are a whole community integrated by different members that have different perspectives and everything is important to hear and everything is important to consider. So I think that we're good to go now. Ah, good. Okay. Can can you hear me? Um, yes. Apologies for the technical. And thank you so much for taking advantage of this amazing uh, global advocacy opportunity. And um, I uh, can I move to the second slide? Is that showing? Um, I cannot see my slides. Oh, sorry. Let me move ahead uh, to your slides quickly. One second. I can just begin to speak while my slides come on board because uh, my overall message in making this presentation is really a call to action and uh, an urgent call to action because we are charged with um, moving towards universal health coverage uh, for 2023. So um, here is... Uh, my, my next slide shows that 2021 was uh, a very special year for oral health and the global health community. Uh, you can see that uh, the World Health Assembly in May 2021 uh, approved a resolution that acknowledged the importance of oral health and that oral health should be an uncommunicable disease. And that has elevated uh, oral health to a very significant level on a global platform. It's the most prevalent. Oral diseases uh, affect 3.5 billion people um, around the world with a higher prevalence among the poor, vulnerable and marginalised communities. And with this elevated position, we are now appearing in global advocacy documents from the WHO um, and their recently announced global strategy, as you will see later, will um, include cleft lip and palate among oral health initiatives. So my next slide uh, indicates that we are driven by uh, not just advocacy, but also uh, action through evidence and the research evidence uh, that was pointed out in earlier slides is extremely important to inform policy. So my next slide uh, indicates the importance of education and the development and dissemination of good educational resources. And uh, the dental caries is an uh, eminently preventable uh, disease, as Dr. Mutu and others emphasized. We have evidence of the value of good dietary habits, uh, of toothbrushing uh, with fluoride, topical fluoride applications and fissure sealants, all been effective in preventing dental decay. And concerted action programs have implemented primary prevention uh, as the anticipatory guidance program that uh, Dr. Mutu mentioned, and also the, the Scottish government supported Child Smile program. And underpinning those is the need for a good oral hygiene throughout the life course. Uh, next slide uh, indicates that the FDI and Smile Train teamed up very effectively uh, in a global project and produced a series of documents and educational materials for both the cleft care oral health professionals, that is the multidisciplinary team, it looks after children born with clefts and also for the parents and caregivers. In the next slide, you'll see these um, very effective uh, uh, advocacy and action documents. So the message uh, for oral health professionals and the multidisciplinary team is we must all play our part. 
Uh, the surgeons have told us about the importance of good dental condition for best surgical outcomes. Orthodontists know the importance um, and the uh, psychologists and speech and language therapists also emphasize how important it is for optimum dental disease uh, and management. Um, the action that this leads to uh, is the most important aspect because in January 2023, just a couple of months ago, the World Health Organization produced their Global Oral Health Action Plan. Uh, the next slide gives a uh, little bit of the detail. Um, their guiding principles on oral health. Uh, if we translate those guiding principles um, and substitute cleft lip and palate for oral health in each of these statements, um, this reflects exactly what our agenda is. So a public health approach, integration, uh, workforce models uh, that will respond to populations and different populations in different parts of the world, people-centered oral care, which is so crucially important, um, as we have just uh, heard those advocacy statements from our patients and caregivers. And there's a hundred actions, uh, so a very much action-orientated agenda, which is great for uh, our efforts within this group and 10 of which actually refer directly or indirectly to the challenges that are presented by oral clefts. So my next slide is just to reinforce, we have a, uh, a disproportionately high prevalence uh, amongst uh, those with cleft lip and palate. We have multidisciplinary teams to provide these interventions. We must make it affordable. We must start primary prevention uh, at birth and in the uh, early stages, and we must address the oral health inequalities uh, aspect of clefts, um, as we point out that uh, the optimum care for everyone is a basic human right. So uh, what my overall message is, is we have the uh, um, toolkit, we have the evidence, we have the uh, motivation to make sure that clefts uh, can be, um, in terms of oral health, um, one of the most aspects, one of the, the, the greatest uh, advocacy within uh, oral health for clefts. So I'm happy that uh, we now move to uh, our question and answer session. And uh, I would like to um, invite anyone uh, to present uh, questions for the whole panel. We have everyone available, Dr. Mutu, Dr. Tansipek, uh, um, uh, Mrs. Omoruji, and Grace Peters were all available for the discussion. And you can see that in this webinar, we did make special efforts to involve the voices and views of those who have firsthand experience uh, of clefts as a parent and a patient, um, as well as uh, those who provide the care. Um, so those aspects and uh, are so important uh, to our action plan. Monica, can I ask if there's anything in the chat that we can? Uh... Yes, we have. Um, we don't have any question currently in the chat. We have from Serena Cruz. She's been asking if we will be able to share the WHA policy language here. Yeah, the just to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to mention the World Health Assembly uh, resolution was landmark resolution for oral health in that uh, never before has oral health been considered uh, amongst non-communicable diseases. So we're now elevated to the platform alongside uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, respiratory disorders, cancers. That gives us a very special opportunity. And it also um, ensures 
that with the common risk factor approach, we can address oral problems and oral health problems at the same time as we're addressing cardiovascular disease, cancers, and other health conditions. And it's so important that uh, we present uh, that good oral health means good general health. Uh, and that's the message for integration. And also, we know that cleft lip and palate has now been included in oral health. The original resolution that was considered um, by uh, the World Health Assembly was from Sri Lanka, who made a very special appeal that uh, oral facial clefts would be uh, part of the advocacy for all member states. Thank you, Dr. Masi. And we have um, Selena Cruz who's raising her hand. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you, Professor Mosi. And thank you all for this, for your contributions and Monica for co-hosting this. This is a fantastic event. I feel really fortunate to be here. <clears throat> so I'm I'm putting the question to you all. I um, So I'm coming out of it. I'm coming from the global surgery community, especially the, the advocacy sphere where we're trying to target the, you know, efforts to address neglected surgical patient needs. And from what I'm learning during this um, meeting is the it's just sort of the essential nature of oral hygiene and the role that it plays in um, in wanting to achieve positive or, or good uh, surgical outcomes uh, when it comes to uh, maxillofacial procedures. So then why is it that um, it's sort of seen as a para, like it's a para policy or a para um, advocacy approach and not wholly into the global surgery agenda um, because the agenda is looking at uh, surgery, obstetrics, trauma, and anesthetic care. And I would imagine that um, oral health and the surgical burden of disease associated with oral health emergencies and oral health conditions would need good pain management. You'd want to have, you know, strong surgical ecosystem, um, yeah, so I'm just wondering, and if and if, if there's a deliberate reason or not a deliberate reason, I would like to invite this community to partner with the G4 Alliance, and uh, which Smile Train is a member of, and also within the advocacy efforts that we're doing globally. Thank you. Well, I, can I just uh, begin by uh, saying that- Thank you, Serena, and uh, it is so important to keep learning from other initiatives and just making sure that we are learning from each other as well and looking in our doing joint efforts. So is there another question here? The chat, I think we can just have some good comments. Um, uh, Dr. Puneet Batra, he's also stated that he believes WHO new policy does not mention cleft. Should we push for it? I think Dr. Mossy, you've been involved into into some of that work, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, the uh, policy and action plan, there's a strategic plan, uh, which was published in December 2022, and the action plan in uh, 2023. The direction of traffic within the oral health community uh, will be from now on to use the action plan uh, that WHO have produced uh, as the template for action. And the first major opportunity that that presents will be at the IADR meeting in Bogota, Colombia in, uh, in June uh, 2023. Among those actions, uh, orofacial clefts does get a mention. I'm delighted to see. But also it is referred to uh, in a number of resolutions that say just rare diseases, marginalized uh, conditions, uh, those communities that are disadvantaged. And these are also um, implying uh, not only uh, cleft lip and palate, but noma and other craniofacial conditions. So these are real opportunities. Um, and I picked out 10 of the 100 uh, actions in the action plan. Uh, that we can use um, as our uh, strategy 
And uh, the methods that we will use is um, involve the whole of the global community in oral health, as well as those involved in cleft lip and palate. Um, because as Dr. Mutu uh, Murrigan has pointed out, if we can prevent cleft lip and palate in 95 to 98% pre prevent dental caries in cleft lip and palate patients who are a vulnerable population, that uh, is translatable into the general oral health uh, advocacy and actions. So his anticipatory guidance, and we also call it motivational interviewing or health coaching, uh, can be a crucial tool um, that beyond cleft lip and palate and in the entire community. Thank you, Dr. Mossy. It is important that we get also this um, message to make sure that this is included in the policies and that we get the enough evidence to you know, approach to health systems and just make sure that we're all working together towards this. So I don't think there's another question in the chat. Um, I, I know we're over, but I actually have a question. Um, how common versus how uncommon would you say it is for a dentist to be integrated into a cleft team or to be more aware um, of clefts and the needs of cleft patients? I assume it varies by country, but is it very common or are a lot of dentists unaware of cleft lip and palate? Again, I'm very happy, Sarah, to uh, answer that. I think there's a uh, as you've alluded to, a massive variation in the protocols and the membership of multidisciplinary teams. Um, the um, multidisciplinary teams in the UK uh, all have a dentist um, and the, uh, the dentist is involved from the very beginning, but that is relatively recent. That is only uh, in the last uh, three or four years, whereas prior to that, uh, dentistry was not a mainstream uh, specialty within multidisciplinary teams. Um, the protocols that we try to uh, advocate, uh, for example, through this forum, are that a dentist is a crucial aspect. So hopefully our action planning uh, and our future actions will reflect uh, the importance of oral health. But I think you've pointed out one of the major uh, difficulties uh, within CLEF teams is they're not standardized. Uh, so we must have minimum standards. Um, and I noticed that Bernard has his hand up. So Bernard, please come in. Yes. Um, yes, I, I like to um, mirror your uh, the situation here because we have a lot, um, it's a, a very severe, uh, how's it? Uh, uh, the, the gradient is so uh, big, meaning we have cleft teams with integrated um, dentists, and then we have um, uh, teams which have no dentists. So, and so, uh, because of the, uh, the differences, um, some patients transfer from one team to another because they want, uh, there's a lack of the services that is provided. Thank you. Sarah, and I think that this is also a important point to raise in other cleft teams, because it's not only the fact that if that dentist is part of the team, but also how are they interacting with the rest of the cleft team members? You know, is there is there a way that they can understand like when they need to refer in some other areas? And Anjali, I see in the, in the chat she just mentioned that some of them are also referring the patients to another clinic, like to dental offices outside the, the cleft team. So I think that this is this is one of the things that we need to work on. There's a lot of awareness we need to do, education among uh, students, dental students. When you get out from dental school, it's really so little what you learn about cleft and how to manage cleft patients. So patients born with cleft, sorry. So I think that there's a lot of work we still need to, to do on this. And I'm very thankful for all of you who have joined today because this is what we aim to do with our program of oral health 
through prevention and smeltering. Let's just um, start thinking on, on oral health as something that we can prevent because as Dr. Muthu mentioned, and he um, showed a lot of evidence that if we do prevention, this is something we probably don't need even need to worry about in the future. So uh, I think that this was the first good effort. And um, I know that we're over our time. I don't know if there's any final comments from our speakers. Um, uh, just probably a one single comment, uh, Monica. Thank you for uh, making this happen. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, education and creating awareness uh, among the healthcare uh, professionals, but more than that, an allied healthcare professionals uh, is a, is going to play a major role because dentists alone are not going to prevent dental disease. This has happened already, so we couldn't do that. So it's the uh, key is the early diagnosis and uh, educating uh, anybody related to uh, healthcare uh, around these uh, early diagnosis and simple oral hygiene measures uh, can go a long way. So uh, developing approaches and methods to uh, disseminate this um, as much as possible is going to uh, uh, play a major role in preventing the disease. Uh, that's what I, I, I would like to add there, and thank you very much, yeah. And Mutu, those resources that we have produced uh, through FDI and Smile Train uh, that I displayed in my presentation are going to be widely disseminated and used as educational resources through MOOCs, and hopefully that will also be translated into multiple language and made accessible worldwide. Thank you, Dr. Masi. That's so important that we can share that this incredible work has been developed with Small Train and FDI, and we have educational resources available as MOOCs, which is a massive open online course. Anyone can access to that. You can enter, you can take the course. It takes up around three hours or so, and you learn about cleft, you will learn about prevention, you will learn a lot of uh, um, ways and actions that you can take to prevent oral disease. All of this has been uh, developed by many experts from FDI and, and Small Train. So please, please, I invite you all to go and take a look. I will be sharing the link here in the chat. And we will make sure that with our comms team, we can also provide information in our social media and other channels. So I think that this is the end of, of this presentation. and. Thank you, everyone. Happy World Oral Health Day. This is the first day we celebrate this big, and I'm very honored to be at this place with the speakers and with all of you who have joined. I really hope that we keep growing the number of participants receiving this information. This was a great start, but that's a lot of, a lot of work to do still. Thank you so much, Thank and you, have Monica. a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Monica. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you, Monica. Bye. Thank you, Nice. Thank you, Dr. Nice. Mossy. Thank you, Dr.